Hey there, Vero311, former Marine infantryman, Revolutionary War reenactor, and amateur history enthusiast. And today it is with great pleasure I bring out this. This is an original Harper's Ferry Model 1816 Type 3, also known as a model of 1822-28. I've done a deep dive on the history of this gun, but today I'm actually gonna put it through its paces. I'm shooting a 64 caliber ball with 1F powder out of a 69 caliber barrel. This gun is 190 years old, and this is my first time actually shooting a live round through it. I've already done some safety checks to make sure the stock's fine, but yeah, so let's see how it goes. See that history in the making. Beautiful. Now let's do our test. 70 grains, so I'm actually shooting lower powder. I'm gonna look over the barrel. Look at that smoke. Oh my lord, that is beautiful. If you're a nerd like me, you know. <laughs> 190 years old, awesome. As someone who's shot a lot of firearms in my life, I just, nothing compares. All right, let's go. Aim a little low. There we go, number two. Kicking up some more smoke. So let's talk a little bit about the Harper's Ferry model of 1816. How did we get here? The National Armories were put in in the 1790s, so that way America could produce their own guns. And what they did, the first guns that America made were the Charleville pattern. And the Charleville patterns are heavily based on the French infantry muskets from the system of 1766. And in so those were the first guns made at the National Armory. Again, I have a video about those. And in 18, in the mid 18 teens, they wanted to have more of a standardization between the National Armories, between Springfield and between Harper's Ferry. So they come out with the model gun. And the model gun means that there's, they brought in the superintendents from Springfield and Harper's Ferry together, and they actually had one gun to be the model gun. And that was supposed to be with what both of the National Armories were supposed to keep to. They would send inspectors out, and these inspectors would have gauges, and they would make sure that the National Armories are within the tolerances. And then they would also send it out to the private contractors that were also making these guns. In total, about 700,000 of these Model of 1816, or from the series of Model of 1816 guns would be made. So this lock plate's from 1836, the barrel's 1834. I still have yet to decide if this is an original flintlock in flintlock configuration gun, but it shoots, it might've been converted to percussion, reconverted back and somebody did a really good job. You've seen this before, but we've talked about that enough. Let's continue to shoot. As you can see, I have my top hat because I'm showing it's the 18 teens. Oh, first failure to fire. That's fine, that's built in. Hit. Beautiful. I need to go find my whisk and pick. The model guns went out and Harper's Ferry and Springfield were able to keep within some standardization. Now these guns do not have completely interchangeable parts. The first American firearm to do that would be the, of course the model of 1819 Hall rifle. And the first military mass produced musket weapon would be the model of 1842. Getting to interchangeability of parts is one of the biggest accomplishments in industrial manufacturing of firearms. Just for example, they were pumping these guns out 10,000 a year by the end. Along with industrialization, a lot of machine work takes over the craftsmen, so everything exponentially starts to take off in the 1830s with how many guns they're able to produce. Fun fact, Harper's Ferry barrels are actually not, uh, they had a pretty high failure rate, so, but then they came out with a tilt hammer that was able to make them more reliable. And when I say high, I mean like 10 to 12% of their barrels were failing to be proofed. And proofing is what that P mark means. So this barrel has been proofed and that means they have put three to four times the amount of powder with a ball in it to proof the barrel to see if it will crack or destroy itself. Um, this one obviously passed the proofing and it, the V right below that means it's been viewed. This is all part of the production line to show that this gun has actually made it through the quality control before it was sent out to the arsenals and then sent to either the states or the U.S. Army. So let's, con let's continue to fire.
Musket just had a failure of fire. Two of the most useful tools you have is this. This is the musket tool. I can use this to actually tighten the cock, right, the top jaw of that cock. And then I use this rag. I'm going to use that to wipe off the flint as well as right, wipe off the hammer to clean it off. So with that done, that is your immediate action for a musket. Let's take another shot. Heard that head off into the woods. So how do you actually load a musket? The military way would be you have a pre-made paper cartridge. This one is made from a Brian Jocks novel. So if anyone read Redwall growing up, you'll know that. So this has the powder and the ball self-contained. First thing I do is I bite off the top, spit it away, and I'm actually going to load the pan first. And then I close the hammer, I cast about, and then I push that um, ball with the entire cartridge into the barrel. Then using your ramrod, the more you shoot this, the more it gunks up. Using your ramrod, use that to set the cartridge with the ball all the way to the breech. Like I said, black powder is a very dirty thing, so the more you shoot, the more it fouls up. And that's actually why I'm shooting a 64 caliber ball out of 69 caliber barrel. You do that because you want loose tolerances. If it was actually tighter, you would have more accuracy, but you would actually lose rate of fire. As you can see, this thing starts to gunk up. So let's take another shot with our original model 1816 Harper's Ferry. Hit it. Absolutely beautiful. These model of 1816s would have been the standard American flintlock firearm during the Seminole Wars, during the 1820s, the 1830s. And even I've read accounts all the way up into the Mexican-American War because there wasn't, I'm not a Mexican-American War history buff, but I've heard that there wasn't um, enough caps. So there's units, American units that went off to fight in Mexico with the flintlock model of 1816s. For those of you that have watched the other videos, you know that what's coming up next. Model of 1816s were actually made all the way up until 1841 at Harper's Ferry. Springfield stopped making them a little earlier. And in 1842, America's first percussion musket came out, and this was the model of 1842. This gun's important because it has completely interchangeable parts, but now you have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of these almost brand new flintlock muskets in the arsenals. And so what they do is they actually go in and they have different ways of doing it, but they convert them to percussion. And the model of 1816 sees extensive use in the American Civil War as a percussion conversion. Beautiful. Here we go, a little bit more close up. These continue as percussion conversions during the Civil War. It's important for you to know if you want to purchase an original one of these, a lot of them are actually reconverted to flintlock. That's what this could be because this has a mismatching barrel to lock. This barrel is 1834, the lock is 1836. I haven't been able to really decide if this is completely a reconversion or original. I'm just, it's kind of up in the air right now. I'm having a blast shooting this. I can't really explain to you how much how just, how good this feels in my hands. So let's come back, let's go to full cock. Let's clean off that flint. And let's get another shot over here at Mr. Steel. Got four more rounds. So let's actually see how, let's push it out um, about another 20 yards. So we've pushed it back another 20 yards or so, only about 45 away. Again, bite off, except we're gonna be proactive. We're gonna use the pick. We're gonna pick the touch hole. Look how that brass has just turned completely dirty. Cast about, come in. And using our rammer, seat that. Again, you probably don't need to tap it as much as I do. All right, let's give it another shot. 
try not to flinch. Definitely was a delay on that. So we got a couple more rounds. Again, that good smoke coming out. And uh, let's just keep on going, see how fast we can go. Nice thing about these is they actually have a pan at an angle. That starts off with the French model 1777. And it goes all the way into the AN9, the 1822. And America copies that quite a bit. Um, yeah, we're, we're really starting to get there. Again, this is only 10 shots of uh, 1F powder. But let's keep going. Nice. Two more rounds, see how fast we can go. We're at the Alamo. The enemy infantry is closing in. Cast about. Davy Crockett's still alive. The other guys. William Travis is dead. I'm not from Texas, but my mom is. So I have a connection there. All right, get that gun up. Here they come. Enemy infantry closing. Make ready, take aim, fire! Hit! All right, we got one round left, gents, and a box that doesn't want to play along. This is our last round. They're coming in hot and heavy. All right, cast about. This is all we got, we don't got a bayonet. It was an issue to us in time. So, final round out of an original model of 1816, Harper's Ferry, made in 1834. Get that round down range. We don't need the ramrod, we don't got time. Coming in, fire! All right, now we get ready for the last step. Well, thank you for joining me today in the woods. Again, this is a original Harper's Ferry model of 1816. This is a beautiful gun. There's, I am so happy I've gotten to shoot my original. I'm shooting 70 grains of 1F powder, 64 caliber ball. And yeah, <laughs> thanks for coming out. Thanks for watching me shoot this. And uh, if you guys have a favorite historical musket, please leave that down in the comment section down below. Thanks for joining me today. And until next time, take care.